Howdy, everybody. Happy Thursday. Welcome to another episode of the McCarroll Team Show. Uh, good to see a bunch of you online. Uh, of course, uh, this is our job to share with you the latest news and perspectives that Canadian homeowners and investors need to know and where you'll find the best live deals that are currently available both on and off the market. As always, I have joining me today, Aro Hussein. Hey. Uh, I believe Matt is uh, on his way, hopefully. Uh, we do actually have a, a little bit of a light turnout in terms of our team. Uh, it is the summer. Cam, I believe, is down in Mexico. I believe Tabitha is out in Portugal. And Shannon is, I'm not sure where, up north somewhere, I think. Anyways, uh, but we are still soldiering on here. We're still uh, determined to bring you a great show. Uh, welcome. So uh, as always, before we begin, if you are watching the replay on YouTube and you do get value from the show, please hit subscribe and also uh, share the show with somebody that you think might get value from it. This will help in our efforts to educate investors. And it's one of the ways that, that you can help us reach more people uh, we have a goal of subscribers that we're trying to get to, and uh, your efforts help. And as always, please post any questions, comments, whatever down in the chat below. We love the interaction. Uh, we love the uh, the kind of community that we are building here, and we love uh, we love all the uh, feedback that we get as well. So one of the things that we are going to do, as always, is provide you information that's either not widely available or presented in a way we're breaking it down for you as a real estate investor. So you really understand it in a way that allows you to take advantage of opportunities that may not otherwise see or understand. Uh, we have three live deals today, I believe, um, since it's just me and Aro on here. Aro, did you want to do your deal right now or did you want to do it at the end? Yeah, I can go right now. All right. So I will pass it over to you. I'll share my screen. Um, I wanted to share a buy and hold opportunity for anyone that's looking to basically get into the market, uh, buy something that is in a decent price range, um, quite affordable in my opinion, and um, still have a cash flowing even through this high interest rate period um, and potentially you know, refinance down the road or even liquidate and basically build your equity. Uh, so this would be a buy and hold play at least five years out. Um, it's a two-story detached house in downtown Hamilton. Uh, it's three bedrooms. Uh, it's a decent size. It's not the, the largest home, but you'll notice that uh, the purchase price is really good on this one, uh, given the size and location. Um, it's currently renovated, so I'll show you some pictures. Um, it's not your, you know, brand new full gut type of reno, but it is quite nice. Um, it's not dated or anything like that. So I'll show you some pictures. This, this is actually virtually staged, so don't mind the actual furniture. It looks like this right now. Uh, so you walk in, you have an open concept living room kitchen, uh, and then your staircase to go upstairs. Uh, the unique thing here is it's got, um, it's got another apartment on the same level. So on the main floor, you have two, um, two kitchens, uh, two living rooms. So this is the back of the house where there's a, another living area and a kitchen with a bathroom. So that would be within the door, the access to this apartment would be from the back uh, and it would be a bachelor apartment. Um, it's decent, it's not, uh, again, not your, it looks pretty nice in the pictures, but I think, you know, once you're there, you'll notice that it's not as nice of a re renovation as you expect. Uh, but that being said, I think it's good enough to be rented out at decent rents. Um, the property is completely vacant. This is the upper floor where you have three bedrooms and a bathroom. Again, virtually staged. This washroom actually looks pretty nice. Uh, here's the backyard. Some work can be done there just to make it more appealing. Uh, it's actually got a long lot. Uh, unfortunately, no parking on this one, but you do have an option to get street parking. Uh, and it's around $106 for the year. Uh, which is pretty cheap. Well, nowadays, um, there are certain uh, properties that charge $50 a spot for parking, uh, and that's per month. So this one, uh, if you get a city um, issued permit on the street, it's only going to cost $106 for the tenant. Uh, that's a lot better than paying $50 a month. So I'll quickly run the numbers on it. 
Uh, it's centrally located in the Lansdale neighborhood, uh, pretty close to all your amenities downtown, GO station, LRT stations, uh, future LRT stations. Um, and then also your amenities like, um, you know, shopping centers. Uh, there's the bars, you know, the center mall, which is around here, it's a little bit further out, but um, that's where most people downtown, I feel, go to. Um, other than Jackson Square, which is right in the center of downtown, uh, that's like another strip mall where you'll find a lot of big, big box stores and whatnot. Uh, quickly jumping into the numbers, uh, they're asking 575, not only offers. Um, I have the purchase price at 550. Um, maybe we can get them down even lower, given that uh, the interest rates are going up. I think more and more people would be more motivated to sell. Um, and I ran the numbers at 550, 20% down. Um, I'm projecting 2100 for the upper uh, main level and the upper unit, which is three bedroom. Uh, and then that's including utilities. So all inclusive, this is not separately metered. So you are gonna have to do all inclusive or you, you charge them a little bit less, but have them pay per portion of your uh, utilities. A lot of people do that. Uh, but here I'm running it 2100 all inclusive. Uh, and then the bachelor unit, 1100 all inclusive. So with those rents, here's a breakdown of your expenses. Uh, you're gonna pay gas, um, hydro and water, which is through Electra, property taxes, 2400 for the year, insurance around 166 per month. It's a small house, so I don't see your insurance being that high. Um, I have a 5% repairs and maintenance, which is pretty good, $160 per month on average, uh, annually around 1920. Uh, no rental equipment here, and I'm using 4.5% interest rate, and at those numbers, 30-year amortization, your cash flow is $65, yay. Um, right now, with, <laughs> with the interest rates being so high, uh, anything that's green, I'm happy with, um, even if it's neutral, right? So this factors in, uh, you know, a little bit of repairs and maintenance as well, so you have a little bit of a cushion. Uh, and the rents, I feel, are pretty conservative, 2100 for a three-bedroom and 1100 for a bachelor. In terms of ROI, um, you know, appreciation, 6%, which is pretty average for the last 50 to 100 years. Your ROI is pretty good. If you factor in all three components of it, you're looking at around 33% annual return on your first year um, based on your down payment and holding costs and, uh, and closing costs, sorry. So if you're looking at something like that, the requirement first, uh, capital requirement for something, um, this price range, you're looking at 122,000. Um, you know, you invest 122K, you're getting a 33% return annually, um, which is pretty great. So nice. Looking for yeah, something the area is really good for future value for sure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a win. Nice. All right. Uh, if you are interested in that property uh, or other ones that we do have our eyes on, of course, these are not the ones we present are not the only ones. Uh, we spend all of our time looking at these. We have lots of other options, but uh, these are the ones that we choose to present and that we think are actually really good, uh, not just current deals, but future deals as well. I see we've been joined by our other super agent, Matt Greiner, as well. No one can see you unless you talk. <laughs> Hello. Sorry about that. That's all right. Uh, Matt, did you want to do your deal now or did you want to wait a bit or how are you feeling? Yeah, sounds great. We'll, uh, we'll dive right in. Give me a sec just to bring this up. So what I'm presenting today is a legal duplex in the Ainsley Wood neighborhood. So Ainsley Wood, as you may or may not know, near McMaster University. Um, and with that, I think it gets kind of a bad rap as a neighborhood on the whole because there are certain streets that are very student rental oriented so if you are trying to you know have a young family or younger professionals tenant the property generally investors go well there's too many students there i'm just going to stay away so the reason i like this one is it's located in kind of the southeast end of ainsley wood so this is over the rail trail, which is a large hiking, biking trail that runs kind of uh, east to west through Western Hamilton. Um, and it is very family oriented. So when I previewed this property, I made sure to like walk the street up and down. Um, you know, I saw it on a weekend around like five or 6 p.m. So that's when students are gonna get ready to go party for the weekend. So if they're gonna be out, they're gonna be out then. And uh, didn't see any of them. So that is kind of a nice sign. 
Um, so this was fully renovated top to bottom um, starting in 2021. Um, this has been done as a flip, um, but it is a fully legal duplex. So it's a one and a half story home. So the main floor and half story is part of the main unit. And then the basement unit is a one bedroom. So just to give you a better idea of what this looks like, um, again, it's fully renovated. So this is totally turnkey. You have to do absolutely nothing. So this is coming in the front door. We have a bit of a mudroom set up with the front hall closet for the main uh, tenant. And then this is their main bathroom. So it's one bathroom per unit. Um, this is a four piece bath, quite nice, lovely finishing. Um, great size kitchen living combo and then you'll see this kind of drops down at the back and this is where the sunken in dining room is um, but really clean finishes and normally when flips are done you can really start to see the quality of the work when you look into like you know okay on the when they grouted the tile for the backsplash you know did they put a proper threshold strip on the edge of the tile you know did they caulk and seal everything properly because if it's a bad flip, then they'll rush through these steps and they generally won't do a great job of it. And I didn't see any evidence of that when I was looking through. Um, so this is the sunken and living room and then laundry for the main floor is at the back here in this little room that you can see. Um, and this is the walk out to your own private rear yard. So the thing I like about this too is that both backyards for both tenants are separately sectioned. And it's because it's a corner lot, you still have ample amount of parking. So it's four car parking with this as well. So you'd be able to charge uh, $50 a spot and have two parallel spots per unit. Um, and this is the walk into the basement apartment here. It's own separate entrance. Everything's been done to code and done with permits. So no issues with the quality of the work. Great height. I was actually quite surprised because when I first looked at these photos, I thought, well, you know, that door is pretty close to the ceiling. How much height do we actually have here? And I was able to comfortably walk around with no issue. And I'm six foot two. I know you can't tell because of the camera angle right now, but <laughs> um, really nice space, lovely bathroom as well. And then this is what I kind of found. It was a little strange seeing the laundry inside the bedroom. But at the same time, I'm thinking like, if you're a young professional who's doing his master's or PhD at Mac, you're gonna come home and you're gonna literally take your clothes off and throw them in the laundry. And then you're gonna go to bed. You're gonna wake up and then you're gonna go to the living room and start studying again for whatever else you need to do that day. So you, it really kind of works out well for that. This is the uh, side view of the yard here and you can see how large that lot actually is. So you do have all this additional yard as well, which is pretty great. Um, so yeah, I really like this one. So breaking down the numbers, more importantly, what's it, uh, what's it worth? What's it going to go for? So it's listed at uh, 799,900, which is about hundred K less than a comparable that is directly across the street. Um, but even at that, I think they're both still fairly overpriced. Uh, the reason for this is that over the last two years, we did see, uh, Hamilton West neighborhoods really, heat up in terms of their price and appreciation. And although it is a lovely home and it is well fixed up, um, I think the previous owners bought it at like 450. Um, even doing a top to bottom reno, I don't see it selling for more than 760. So that's what I've put in here. And it's been on market for about 45 days now already. So with that being said, very similar to Aro's place. Unfortunately, we don't have sub meters for our water and our gas. So we've set this up to be a 60-40 split between the two units, and that's why it's zeroed out. And there are separate hydrometers for electricity, so those tenants will be putting their own, uh, own account together anyways. Uh, hot water rental, $35 a month. Um, at 20% down at 4.25% on a 30-year amortization, this works out to $226.51 per month, minus your vacancy and repair. With all expenses, you're just slightly negative. Um, but again, if you were to self-manage, this would be a little bit higher as well. We have a 6% rate of appreciation for the property as well. And we estimated the upper main floor two bedroom unit uh, right around the 2200 mark. And then the one bedroom basement apartment would be at about uh, 1600. 
And then your additional parking is how we're getting to the 4,100. And I, sorry, I said 2,200 for the upper, it was 2,400 that I had it at, my apologies. So with that being said, we have an internal rate of return over 10 years of 17.8% which is quite fantastic. Anything over 15%, I think, is a great steal in this market. Um, a modified cash on cash return of 6% with uh, principal repayment considered. Um, really like this one. Very simple, turnkey, great area, close to the highway. Great for young professional or young family as well. Yeah, and that's a, that's a good price for a legal, fully legal duplex in, in this market, even though it's a little smaller. Fully renovated yep. well. But Great. well laid out in terms of the square footage, like, you know, mm -hmm. with the half stories, you always get worried. You're like, all right, well, how far in is that roof actually leaning? Can I actually yeah. properly walk around upstairs? And the master bedroom is actually quite spacious. I was pretty pleasantly surprised with that. Yeah, that's I, I like it when, A, I see good renovations. And uh, one of the first things I look at is trim. Uh, that's, yep. that's so determining. I see places where... They, you know, they tack all the trim down and they don't bother to fill the holes. And it's such a simple step, but that kind of speaks to the quality of overall renovations. But, uh, you know, exactly. Yeah. So like you, you do the same thing for trim that I do for grout. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> these are uh, these are real estate tricks that we look at when we uh, when we look at places. So if that property does interest you, please reach out at sold at Uh If you are not on the buyer list, uh, you can go to our website and sign up for the buyer list as well. And you will get sent these properties, the weekly investor properties as well. So uh, we're going to, I'm going to take you through obviously the, uh, the weekly market update. And then we will talk about what we will talk about, which of course we know. So in terms of what we've seen, it's kind of more of the same. We're in summer now. Traditionally, summer is a little bit slower we are seeing new listings finally kind of come down. There's a little bit of a spike up, but it's still, you know, they're dropping. I think uh, two reasons for that, obviously, people have recognized that the market has cooled down, the rate hike definitely, um, and people are just going on vacation. Like I said, we, we usually see uh, listings kind of come down anyways. Uh, and we saw, you know, that spike up here where uh, you probably can't see my pointer, but the spike from kind of April, May, June, usually that spring market is, is when things do, uh, do come up quite a bit. So pretty regular occurrence that we see during this time. Uh, is it a good time to buy? Let's talk about that because what in the world will we, we be talking about for headlines? I wonder. So the Bank of Canada, for those of you that don't know, up their rate surprisingly by one full basis point. Uh, most people were predicting 0.75. I know a couple people thought maybe they would take it easy and go to 0.5. I don't know how many people actually predicted that. If you did, gold star to you. Uh, unfortunately, that's all that you get because we're all living in this new reality of a one point, uh, one point hike in the rates. So what does that mean for us? Well, let's take a look. Uh, you know, this particular economist with the University of Laval, Stephen Gordon, says it's clear the bank has miscalculated the speed with which inflation was going to heat up and are now trying to course correct on the fly. Isn't that always the story? They're playing a bit of catch up here, and that's partly why they're going up so fast, he said in an interview. While the size of the hike was outside the norm, he says it was warranted given the unprecedented challenges facing the economy today. We're in a situation where we have supply chain disruptions, really high oil prices, pent up demand coming out of the pandem pandemic, he said. And we're in new territory here, so there's very little to guide us in the way of history. We're just gonna have to feel the way forward. And just to kind of drop the point home, this is uh, the red line here is the inflation rate. So you can see since January 20, where it kind of bottomed out pandemic times, it has just kind of taken off. And uh, we all know that uh, the, um, the Bank of Canada is reactive, not proactive in terms of this. I uh, you know, did uh, quite a bit of reading just to get a sense of, as I said last week, you can ask 10 economists their opinion and get 10 different ideas of this. Um, and there was some consensus, but there was a lot of differing opinions on what all of this meant. Uh, will the inflation rate come down? They're hoping it will. Will it come down in a timely fashion so that it doesn't damage 
you know, the economy, we are, everyone's using the R word recession. Uh, there's a, it's fairly likely that we will go into some recession, how quickly, how deep that goes, that is what's up for debate. And, uh, you know, again, the Bank of Canada, I feel like if we do get into recession, depending on how, how deep it is and how quickly it comes on, I can absolutely see them course correcting again and dropping rates. Personally, I think that's what's going to happen. I know we talk about it a lot on the show. Cam and I are of very similar mind that uh, they can only go so far before they really start damaging the economy. And that seems to be the blunt instrument that they have to try to rectify the situation. And they wield it with great might, as we saw on the 1.1% 1. 1 down. So what does that mean for you as an investor? This is how much a one point rate will in will change your mortgage. So if you have a $500,000 mortgage over five years, you're going to pay about 16k more over 700. If you have a 750k mortgage, you'll pay about 24k more and on a $1 million mortgage, it means that you're going to be paying about 32k more over five years. So is it a good time, bad time to buy? Um, so we've already seen prices erode, obviously. We've seen prices come down uh, a little bit. So uh, the balance for me, and I know that I said it last week, but as an investor, we're always looking at the numbers and we're always looking at our long-term strategy. So it's really easy to get scared by short-term and say, wow, well, my mortgage has gone up $100 or $200 or $250 a month. But in terms of looking over the five-year plan, does it make sense? Uh, and again, I did do some reading. By and large, when I when I did this research, there was a general consensus about when things would bounce back. Uh, so TD's latest provincial housing market outlook released at the end of June projected that home prices in Canada are set for a further fall in the current rising rates environment with a 19% peak to trough decline. That's from the highest point to the lowest point anticipated between the first quarter of the year when things were absolutely at their peak and Q1 2023. So next next wind, January, February, March, basically. That report indicated little prospect of an overall housing market meltdown, noting that home prices are likely to grow modestly after 2023's first quarter, with some recovery expected in national housing demand. So from the reading that I did do on this, that was a pretty general consensus. Is the timeline was all a little bit different, but overall, most of the uh, banks and economists that I read thought by 2023, we would actually see things to start to bounce back. And that's quicker than you think. That's six months, nine months away, maybe even a year away. Um, so in terms of investment, this may be the window uh, to buy. Again, doing your numbers at the higher rate, it's highly unlikely, this is my opinion, but it's highly unlikely that rates are going to stay crazy high for three, four or five years. It just doesn't seem to make sense. Um, Again, the goal here is to try to get inflation down. Will it work? Probably to some extent. The supply chain uh, issues definitely do play into that, but uh, that's something that as an investor you're going to keep an eye on. But if you're running your numbers at the higher numbers, at the higher rates, and they still make sense, that drop in prices uh, actually make this a really good window to pick something up. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that further in a little bit. Indeed, far from a crash, what's in store for Canada's housing market is best described as a recalibration. The authors report economist Rishi Sandhi told CP, CMP, while home prices across the country will continue to moderate, they're still set to remain significantly higher than they were at the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic in March 2020, he pointed out. There's a 19% peak to trough decline baked into the forecast that only partially retraces the near 50% increases that we saw over the course of the pandemic, he said. So it's more of a recalibration. Now, again, when I looked into this a little bit deeper, um, I, I couldn't really find anybody that thought that things were going to tank. Um, and there's a number of reasons, and we talk about them often. Immigration is a big one. The green belt in this particular area, which we're looking at investing in kind of the extended GTA for sure. 
And the last one is supply. And supply, I think, is becoming a bigger and bigger issue. More people are being aware of the supply issue, so much so that I know uh, one of Cam's favorite uh, guys, Ben Rabideau, tweeted this. It's a story that says the federal government commits to building 260 new homes in Toronto, and his caption is, embarrassing that this warrants a story. So to me as an investor, I actually think that that's, that speaks to the kind of the, not the stability, but the long-term viability of the market in the GTA, especially in Hamilton. Um, Hamilton is still more affordable than Toronto. And even with the rate hikes, if you're doing your numbers correctly and it makes sense to buy, we're always looking at five years, 10 years buy and hold. Um, you know, I, I know some people are, uh, Actually, I'll hold that point a little bit. So, you know, I would love to hear any comments if anybody has anything else to add on this, uh, any thoughts, but um, it's just the new reality. And I know uh, Cam had sent out an email and I really liked it, which was uh, it generally takes buyers or people in the market about 60 days to mentally recalibrate to the new reality. So, you know, and we saw that at the beginning of the pandemic when everybody freaked out, they weren't sure what was going on. There was about two months of just flat, everything kind of not didn't tank, but activity tanked. And then what happened was people kind of got to a place of, okay, well, I guess this is just how it is now. And things took off. So I, I personally think as you know, we get through summer, uh, a lot of buyers, a lot of even sellers will start to realize, well, this is just the reality now. So I have to recalibrate my expectations moving forward. People still have to move. People still have to buy. Um, as investors, there's always opportunities. So it's just a matter of you making sure that those opportunities fit your goals, uh, what it is that you're trying to accomplish with your vision. So one, you know, a one point rate hike, that's pretty high. But uh, I know we talked about mortgages a couple of shows ago. And personally, you know, even if they stay kind of higher for about two years, but then they start dropping for the next three years of my personal five-year mortgage as a variable, I'm going to come out ahead. Uh, so again, you have any comments, any questions about that, throw them in the chat. Uh, we'll be happy to discuss them. But uh, personally, I, 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 I almost, I don't think the sky is falling. I think that a lot of people are going to, if anything, have a little bit more certainty now that they understand, you know, when, when when there's an impending rate hike, it's like this boogeyman that no one is sure what's going to happen or what's going to jump out of the closet. And once it happens, you take, you know, you take it in, you understand it, uh, you just recalibrate and you just uh, do your numbers on a different in a different context and then move forward and still evaluate properties if they make sense for you. So hopefully that makes sense for all of you. Um, so with that in mind as well, uh, we do do our home sellers workshop. If you are thinking of selling anytime in, you know, three months, six months, even in a year, uh, I will be doing a seller's workshop next Wednesday at 7 p.m. Even if you want to get prepared, it's actually quite important uh, if you're thinking a year out, uh, maybe there's some renovations you can do. Maybe you want to understand what is going on. Uh, Andrew just dropped the chat link or the link in the chat uh, to sign up. It's a lot of great free information, you know, on the McCarroll team. We're really big on providing a lot of value for our uh, for our clients and for just our community. And this is a really great resource. Now, with that in mind, and I did want to touch on this because this is a conversation that I've had with a few um, potential sellers and investors. Why in the world would I sell right now? And this is uh, that that's an excellent question. And I, I've it's actually been on my mind. Um, I know I mentioned uh, that I am actually looking at a new project and it's a big project and it's a different project than I've done before. It's a little daunting. And uh, ultimately, I think because it's going to be a longer term project and quite a big one, at some point, I'm going to have to consider probably selling one of my properties to complete the project and to place a mortgage on it. So why would I sell in this market? And this actually touches on a, a, a lot of the philosophy that we have on the team. So, you know, money is great. We all love money. We all love investing. We want to make sure that we're secure in our future. We want to make sure that we have things to pass on to our family, uh, which is the goal of investing. But <clears throat> if you're just focusing on the money, 
Uh, and I've seen it, uh, you know, we, we deal with people or even sometimes when we're looking at properties and we get the story of, you know, oh, this seller owns multiple properties. He's 85. Um, you know, he's just, he, he's going to liquidate. And um, everyone, you know, has their own motivations and their own reasons for doing it. But the thing I always find interesting about that was, so, you know, I, I, I don't know their situation, but I'm always curious about, you know, they worked hard, they bought these properties. Uh, when did they enjoy the fruits of their labor? Uh, you know, and, and it's, a, it's a really interesting question that I encourage all of you to actually dig in on because investing without, without a, 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 you know, like a why, it's called a big why. There's, a, there's a, a person named Simon Sinek. He has a really great talk about it. If you can find your motivate, and I mean your real motivation, um, that actually will determine a lot of your choices. So if your motivation is just chasing money, you'll never have enough. And you'll wind up 80 and have a big pile of money and you'll never have turned around and looked at it and enjoyed it. And so for me, this next project um, is something that I really want to do. I've, uh, I'm conditional on some waterfront property. I'm going to build a cottage on it, something I've always wanted to do. It is a big job. It's very daunting. Um, the thought of selling one of my properties, which is it's cash flowing like crazy. It's a great property. Um, you know, again, in this market say, well, why would you do that? And for me, and I, I've discussed this with people, if selling one of your properties gets you towards what you want to ac actually accomplish and do, that makes sense because that is connected to my big why. So my big why is having a lovely cottage. I can take my family there. I can take my friends there. You know, when I have downtime, it's really relaxing for me. And as an asset on waterfront land, just looking at it from an investor perspective, by the time I'm completed the project, it will actually be worth quite a bit and it will be a smart project. But again, um, when I look at having to sell one of my properties, the upside is it forwards what I actually want to accomplish in terms of investing. Um, so I, you know, far be it for me to tell you what your goals are, but it is something that I always encourage all of our clients to look at is, you know, if, if it makes sense to sell a property in terms of getting you where you want to be in five, 10, 15 years, uh, then it, maybe it's, it's worth a conversation or worth looking at. Uh, most of the, most of the, uh, the, the reading that I did on this rate hike, uh, a lot of people said uh, it'll probably be two, three, maybe four years before we get back to that peak back that we did in February. Now, prices, everybody was fairly consistent that by early next year, mid next year, prices will absolutely have been stabilized and start creeping up again. But because we had that drop for them to get back up to where they were in February, it's going to take time uh, because they just don't foresee, you know, those 30% gains that we were getting before. So I know for me, um, it makes sense. Uh, I'm going to probably wait until the spring or summer, but if I see a turn in the market in fall and it makes sense for me, it's something that I'm contemplating. So I think as a good investor, always uh, kind of reviewing your goals and reviewing what it is you're trying to accomplish, where you're going is very important. So uh, any comments, any questions about that, anything that uh, you know you, uh, your th that's on your mind, please drop it in the chat and I'll be happy to address it. Um, so Wally, actually, before I get to my property, uh, I find that it's difficult to find a waterfront land that you can build on. Did you have a hard time finding the lot? Did it already have some kind of dwelling on it? Um, because it's been something that has been on my mind uh, for years now, I always kind of pick away at it. I always look at it here, there, and everywhere. I have certain criteria that I was looking at. I don't want to drive five, six, seven, eight hours. You can find land up in Temeskiming or you know up in, in Timmins for cheap, but I'm not driving eight, nine hours. I'm just not. So it had to be within about three hours. It had to be a service lot somewhat. I didn't want to cut a road. I didn't want to cut hydro. It had to be on a winterized road. Uh, these were all criteria that were important for me. So the lot that I did found is actually uh, 11 acres, which was a big appeal because most of the ones I was looking at was smaller. Um, the seller already put a road in. The, the seller already started the hydro process. And it turned out that uh, it's going to be significantly cheaper than I thought to uh, actually connect the hydro, which is good. 
So my due diligence now, because I, I've done some bigger projects, but a full build is I need septic plans. I need foundation plans. I need to understand framing pricing. I need to understand design on an entire house. I need to understand, you know, all my setbacks, not much of an issue with 11 acres, uh, but it's been really educational. And at first it was a little daunting and, and frightening, but I noticed my mentality has really leaned in on the challenge and I'm actually excited about learning all of this. I'm excited about, uh, believe it or not, buying a chainsaw and taking down a bunch of trees. I, uh, I, I went up uh, last week because uh, like I said, I did build a conditional period in so I can do my due diligence. So I don't look like an idiot who bit off more than he can chew. I had a septic designer come up and I showed her where I was thinking of putting the cottage and the septic and she gave me the big thumbs up. Uh, so good. That's one hurdle. Uh, that's one hurdle jumped. Um, and the further I get down this road, it seems very viable just to give you quick idea, um, all in, and I know there's going to be cost overruns, but I'm looking at about 650 for the land and the build. And, uh, I did a comp search of places up there, minimum a million, maybe as high as 1.2 granted. These were not custom built places. I'm not building a giant, giant place. I don't need a giant place, but it is going to be nice three bedrooms. Um, so again, uh, looking at, at, at an exit strategy of, you know, at least if I finish it, uh, the upside of selling one of my properties is I'm, I'm a little mortgage constraint right now. So that will actually uh, place, you know, that much more ability for me to place a mortgage on it. And, uh, and that way, at the end of it, I might have options if it costs me even 700, but I can sell it for 1.2, 1.3, because it's probably going to be a two year project. Uh, that's a pretty good profit margin. And, and, and ultimately, you know, I have options. If I want to keep it and place a mortgage on it, I can. If I want to sell it, I can. If I want to Airbnb it, I can. Um, but it's a, it's a different strategy for me. But I know as an investor, I personally want to grow. Um, I love doing duplexes. I've done two of them. I've helped a lot of clients do multis, uh, single families. It's great. Um, I just want to not just grow as an investor, but again, this is part of my big why, understanding why I'm investing. And uh, I can't stress it enough. I, I really encourage all of you to check in with yourself and understand if you are forwarding your go goals. And I talk to clients who sometimes say, well, I want 10 doors or 20 doors. That's a great that's a great, that, to me, that's a short-term goal, even if it's a five-year plan, because I look at that and say, so once you have accomplished that goal, what will that allow you to do? And a lot of people haven't thought that far ahead. Um, and I think I just, you know, I, I know as I'm getting older and gray in the beard, I don't want to be one of those people that turn around and when I'm 75 and, and have built this, you know, really great portfolio and not have, not have enjoyed the fruits of that labor if that makes sense. Uh, a few more comments here. Uh, congrats, Adam. Thanks, Andrew. Uh, so Deb C, it's near Magnetowan. I don't know if you know the north, but it's kind of Perry Sound, a little further east. Um, it's a nice lake. Again, 300 feet of frontage, well-treed, 11 acres. It's It checks so many boxes. It, it To be honest, it's not my ideal, ideal property, but the opportunity that I feel like is there is really big. I might love the place when I'm done. And if I'm not, I have options. Um, and again, I just get excited about, I have a short attention span, so I want to do something different. And this is very different. And this will, again, um, I love learning. This will forward my learning. That's a, that's a big why for me is I like knowing how to do things. Um, you know, cutting down trees sounds like fun. We'll see. Uh, and, and learning how to maybe operate an excavator. I'm not sure. This is all part of my due diligence. Soil testing done, Wally. I'm in the process of that. The, uh, the uh, septic designer did seem to think that it was sandy soil, which is excellent. Uh, again, I've learned this about septic systems. Clay soil is the worst. I was worried it was clay. It's not rocky. She took a look. She did say she'd have to dig some test holes, but she said it looks sandy, which is excellent. Um, you know, the septic uh, company said it might cost another five grand if they had to truck sand in for the uh, leaching bed. So uh, I know I've blathered on a lot about my property. Uh, again, still conditional, but I'm, I'm really excited about it. I'm, I'm going to get some video and hopefully just share with you kind of the vision 
Um, I know as an investor, I get really excited looking at other people's projects in process. I really like seeing the beginning of them, seeing the vision, and then seeing it come together. Uh, I get a, a lot of satisfaction out of seeing your projects and seeing other people do that as well. So uh, by all means, uh, I will share some, some info on that. So um, Matt, did you have anything to add about the, uh, the interest rate hikes? I know you're a thoughtful, uh, thoughtful guy when it comes to that type of thing. And we, uh, we talked about that. I appreciate it. Um, I, I, yeah. So with the hundred percent, you know, hundred basis point increase, um, I think Cam really hit the nail on the head to say that, look, this is going to create some sort of lag in terms of price awareness for sellers and buyers within the market. And because of that, people will likely wait to see what happens. Um, and this wait to see what happens mentality seems to be, in my mind, very similar to the type of phrasing and conversation we were using at the beginning of the pandemic when phase one hit. And all the activity slowed down and everyone went, oh, what do we do? Um, so I think with the same kind of language that we're hearing today, I think it really is going to lend itself well to buyers having way more opportunities just because they're willing to engage with the market and take on some uncertainty and then work hard during you know negotiations to be able to get a great price. And I think this is where you're going to really see agents that work hard and know how to negotiate well do much better um, comparatively to some of the agents over the last two years who are very good at throwing a deal together and seeing if it sticks and if it doesn't well we'll go find another one we'll put another offer in the next six hours um, now that there are enough opportunities that you can actually go through and qualify five or ten potential options and then work through those to see which ones are going to be you know easiest to negotiate with and to be able to get the uh most value for your money. I think those opportunities are really going to be at, you know, the four over the rest of July and into August. And just going back to that um, activity chart that we had uh, with the McCarroll team, right? If you look back on that uh, activity, are you pulling it up, Adam? Or? Yeah, I am right now. Perfect. So yeah, if we, uh, if we look at uh, this chart, um, you can see that new listings generally tank in all the July periods. Yeah, and that was so, even the case over the last two years. And this runs back to... It goes back further. I mean, it was a little different. So this, that one is, you know, you can see July, here is that trough before it, that green line goes up. And then even before that, even with that, you know, the January, December, we always see winter and summer are generally the slowest portions. Um, obviously, this goes back to the pandemic with that low spot on the far left of the chart where it's April. So that was a little unprecedented. But by and large, uh, Matt's bang on that uh, in the summer, we, we just do usually see a sag in the market. So I think that's just going to lend itself well to buyer opportunities. Um, but again, with the interest rate increase, yeah, it sucks. Your carrying costs are higher. But this also means it's going to be tougher for first-time home buyers to break into the market as the market tightens up and prices get closer and the spread tightens overall, which will probably also lead to a further increase in rental rates as more buyers have to go into that market. So if you have a property that is newly vacant or you're looking at acquiring something that has vacancy in place, the case is probably stronger for you to get a better asking rent now than it would have been over any period of the last two years. And the fact that your purchase price is so much lower than it would have been during these heavy uh, competitive market phases that we went through in the last two years means that you'll probably do a little bit better in the long run. Um, and then just kind of segueing into Adam's property with that. Um, so you're going to take one of your existing listings, uh, your existing properties that you've already spent money on improved. And then you're going to sell that to re-leverage yourself into something that has even greater room for after repair value. Yep. Because you're taking cool. land and you're intensifying the use of it. Yeah. And that, that's the goal. And, and like I said, it's, it's a balance between the particular property that I'm thinking of. I have a, a lot of equity in, but, uh, 
part of the motivation for me also is when I talk to my mortgage broker, I, uh, I've kind of maxed out. So for you sure. know, if I finish this project and I sell that property, not only will I have the equity out that I can use to improve this property, like you said, but now I have another six, 700 K of mortgage that I can place on this. Um, and it just, it, it just makes sense. And uh, I had friends, uh, very wise friends when I was, cause I hemmed and hawed about it quite a bit uh, for a number of reasons. One, it's a really big project Two, just, you know, does it make sense to sell a property that I have that much equity in? Uh, but they all did remind me that, uh, you know, this, this is something that I want. This is something that forwards me towards my life goals. And uh, you know, my one friend did say, as long as you have an exit strategy that does not, you don't, you know, doesn't cost you your shirt, then it's, why wouldn't you do it? And, yep. uh, and that was an excellent piece of advice, actually, because, you know, I, I have multiple exit strategies when I actually looked at it. So it made sense. Yeah. And in my mind, I think it's a great move too, because you're moving from, uh, you know, a part of your portfolio where you're kind of maxed out in terms of your positive arbitrage or leverage that you can manage. And you're re distributing that to a new property that you're going to actually have further leverage and a little bit of a higher rate of uh, overall, you know, after repair value. So there's a little bit more equity in play, even though it isn't built up as long as your current holding, right? So you probably end up doing better in the long term, making the switch comparatively, just holding on to something that you already had a lot of equity in, because eventually that equity is going to kind of max itself out. Right? Yep. And the the third the third thing that I'm thinking because my mind doesn't stop working is that you know uh, I'm going to acquire a whole bunch of new skills that that I understand about building on a you know building is conversions are great and there's a lot I've learned a ton doing those building is a whole different beast uh, but then there's this added bonus of if this works and makes sense this could be a viable business model for me to develop and maybe this is you know I keep an eye out for. Uh, really good opportunities uh, and do this, you know, and, and I think that's always the goal of, of a lot of investors is to, I know RO is hundred percent in this, uh, in this place of if, if you can get into bigger projects, the returns are bigger. And so you have to do less smaller projects to get a bigger return. Sure. There's a bigger risk profile, but if you really try to mitigate that with the, with the numbers that you've done um, you know, it, in terms of your returns, it makes a lot of sense. Yeah, and I think that holds up perfectly well in terms of economic theory, right? We're talking about economies of scale at that point. And uh, you're going to be able to project a lot more value over time through doing that and scaling up that way. Yep. Good. Well, I appreciate that. Uh, I thought I was going to chime in, but I think he's doing something. I wanted to talk about his project. So, uh, yeah, we love talking about all this stuff. Any questions or comments, throw them in the chat. I do actually have one property that I am going to share as well. So I will do that right now. So this is actually one of our listings and um, I haven't presented it because it was tenanted and it was tenanted at a very low rate. I think they were getting 1250 for an entire house, um, which that's pretty low rent. Since then, uh, the tenant has agreed to leave. So this will be provided vacant and that completely changed the landscape of this. So a single family house, it's actually three bedrooms, even though the square footage isn't, uh, isn't huge. Uh, the bedrooms are decent sizes. The one is very big. It's got laundry in there. Um, and so we'll just look at the numbers. The area that it's in is right here near Center Mall, not too far. The LRT is going to be uh, south of there on that yellow line, which is Maine. Um, and you're looking at it is a price of 479. Uh, you know, back in February, we were seeing these go for 550, 600. So this to me is the opportunity. Uh, so looking at that at a 479 purchase price, I'm sure you can get 2600 for it. We're seeing rents. That's the one thing about uh, the rate hikes. Rents are going to increase. It, it's kind of it's unfortunate. I mean, it's it's good for investors, but it's unfortunate for renters that the byproduct of the rate increase and people getting out of the market is there will be more renters that just supply and demand dictates rents are going to go up. So 2,600 I have, you may be able to get more, um, you know, your water. So you're only really going to have to pay water on this. Electricity is going to be paid for your water heater, 
Property taxes are low in this area, which is really great. Your insurance and then all the rest of it's going to be paid. I usually recommend trying to self-manage single family homes. If you have a good, if you get a good tenant in there, you have a good relationship with them, should be a minimum of what's going on. So I did a 479 purchase price and I did 5.5% on the loan amount. Uh, I wanted to bump it up. I wanted a little bit of a safety margin there. We're not that high yet, but I did just want to show you something that even at a 5.5, you are cash flowing. You're you're just above breaking even, which that's ideal. So any of those lower rates, and you might be paying a lower rate for six months, nine months, it might not even get to 5.5. But if it does, you know that it's at least cash flow neutral. Again, running appreciation over five years at 6%. You will have a mortgage pay down of almost 30K and you will have a, over a quarter of a million dollars in equity in that property at 6%. Um, as we've talked about, Hamilton is usually about nine to 12% over time. Obviously there's a bit of a sag right now, but as I discussed, most economists, most banks even think that uh, early, next, uh, early next year, mid next year, we are going to see things start to rise again. And again, we're usually looking at holding for at least five years to make these make sense. So um, that is the show for today. Uh, pretty quiet crew, but that's great. Hopefully you got some value out of this. Um, as always, if you have not subscribed on YouTube, please subscribe on YouTube. And uh, yeah, uh, is there anything you'd like to add before we head out, Matt? No, I think that's about it. We're going to see kind of where inflation gets us over the next, you know, quarter. And yep. uh, Bank of Canada will make an adjustment if it has to. But uh, hopefully we start to see uh, vacancies for jobs start to fall and employment uh, start to normalize a little bit. Mm -hmm. I know over the last uh, six months, we're starting to see a bit of uh, a va higher vacancy rate for jobs. Um, just, I think, over the last two years. It's an, you know, pandemics really enabled people to start working from home and working remotely and engaging in more fruitful activities that way instead of slogging it out um, in a factory or, you know, for minimum or subpar wage. So until wages start adjusting, I think this trend will probably continue, which uh, will probably drag on our uh, any recessionary event that we may go through. And again, not certain that we'll go through that big of a recession. Yep. Aro, any uh, yeah, part? Two, two things I'm kind of looking out for is um, the next uh, meeting they have about um, releasing the inflation numbers. Um, I think that was yesterday. Uh, and that's why I think we got the 1% rate hike. I think right now we're over 9% in terms of the inflation. So that's what I'm watching next month. And then also the unemployment rate, um, that starts to go up. I think then we technically, I think at that point, that's when the, they're going to start to, to probably slow down the interest rate hikes. So yep. those are the things that I'm looking out for. Good. Yeah. I know that we talk about it a lot, all of us. <laughs> we spend a lot of time at the office talking about where we think things are going. And so, and so far, I'd like to think we've actually been Fairly accurate about, uh, you know, no one saw the 1% hike, but uh, it will be interesting to see what happens over the fall and definitely into spring next year. Um, I know some people think that they're just going to keep raising rates and raising rates and raising rates. I know that uh, by and large as a team, we don't, we think they're going to hit a, hit a wall and they're going to have to start actually actively dropping them. Um, and I personally think sooner rather than later. Uh, looks like we got a few comments here real quickly. Uh, Michael, with rents up, that adds to inflationary pressures. That is true. Uh, he also asked if we could place the link for the recording. It will be on YouTube on our channel. Uh, I believe Andrew can drop a link to the channel. Please subscribe if you have not, because uh, we post a lot of our stuff up there. Lots of great thank yous. They will pause the hikes. That knee-jerk 1% will hurt, will hurt the economy. I uh, absolutely agree. I know that's up for debate, but uh, personally, I, I, I think that uh, I think they've been far too reactionary. And uh, if they did, if they did slower rate increases back last summer, I don't think we'd be probably in this same situation that we were. But, uh, 
you know, the Bank of Canada, like I said, they're reactionary, not proactive. And uh, this is just more evidence of that. So uh, with nothing else, um, I think that's the show for today. Thank you so much for tuning in. We love our, uh, we love all the interaction. We love the community that we're building up here. And if you do need to get in touch with us, sold at mccarrollteam.com. Those are great properties. We have other ones. I have a, a, actually an off-market uh, non-legal triplex that uh, may be available in a really good neighborhood too. So if uh, any of those properties interest you, please get in touch and we will see you next time, guys.